what did the Egyptians expect after they died? Find out about their version of the afterlife on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. In this video, we are going to explore what the Egyptians thought about life after death, and why they went to such tremendous lengths to prepare for their deaths. In order to understand Egyptian life after death, it is important to understand what their world was like and how they thought the universe was structured. Egypt was an agricultural society that oscillated between feast and famine. The typical Egyptian lived within 50 calories of starvation. 30% of the mummies, which represents Egyptians' elite, show signs of chronic starvation and disease. So practically everybody was living on knife-edge agriculture. As a result, the Egyptians were incredibly afraid of starvation. That fear extended into the afterlife. They believed that people needed food and drink in the afterlife, otherwise their souls starved. Thus, Egyptian preparations for the afterlife revolved around food insecurity and supplying their needs for the life to come. Now, the Egyptians had an idea of cosmology that plays directly into their views of the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that they lived on Earth while alive, and above it was the daytime sky, and the sun god Ray traveled in a boat across the daytime sky. Then at night, he entered the nighttime sky to illuminate the underworld. And if a deceased person was of the lower classes, their burials were usually incredibly simple. Essentially, they would dig a hole and just bury the body in the dirt. And that would pretty much be the end of the funeral arrangements. However, if the dead person was part of the upper classes, his body was typically mummified to preserve it for the afterlife. And he would have arranged for himself an elaborate tomb, which was lavishly decorated and filled with grave goods, provisions, lots of nice stuff for the afterlife. Now, the Egyptians believed that when a person died, his ba, or spirit, would not immediately travel to the underworld. Instead, the ba would linger with the body. As the body decayed, the spirit was similarly susceptible to being eaten by demons and servants of malevolent forces who benefited from the byproducts of the decay process. So this is why usually when someone died in Egypt, they started the mummification process immediately to preserve the body as best as possible. Now, the mummification process took generally around 40 days. Then there'd be an additional up to 30 days of, of mourning for a total of 70 days. Then the body was carried to the tomb in a ritual procession. And in that procession, the god Anubis, who is a jackal-headed god, was said to escort the Ba to the grave, and the tomb acted like a portal to the underworld. Now, tombs were not only equipped with food and wine to feed the deceased in the afterlife, but also had equipment that facilitated the return of the soul 
to the world of the living. A sarcophagus, a statue of the deceased, the deceased images placed upon the tomb walls, and the mummy itself could all serve as proxy bodies. Now, proxy bodies were really important to the Egyptian concept of life after death. The Egyptians believed that the soul could leave and return to a body. And they believed that if they provided proxy bodies, that let's say, for example, the, the mummy was destroyed. Some, you know, the, maybe the, the tomb got flooded and it rotted away. Stuff happens. The Egyptians believed that if they provided extra proxy bodies, that any one of these bodies could then serve as a, a backup so that the spirit could return to one of these proxies and then the spirit could receive his food and drink offerings. So this is one of the reasons why the Egyptians had so many images of the deceased inside a tomb because they all served as backups. They, don't, they, they didn't want to take any risks. They were really risk averse when it, came to, it comes to the afterlife. So, uh, <laughs> someone destroys a, a mummy? Okay. Someone destroys the, the statue of the deceased? Oh, it's still okay because you still got the images on the walls. Someone destroys them, them too? Okay, now we're starting to get worried. Really, really worried. So, they're, they're not taking any chances with the afterlife. Because the fear of starvation is that, that pronounced. It's palpable. The Egyptians were deeply, deeply afraid of starvation. But besides all the images of the deceased, tombs were also decorated with false doors. And these were believed to be like a door for the spirit to travel to the underworld. Because one of the things that the Egyptians believed was that the way a spirit traveled to the underworld was kind of like the same way that people travel from one room to another. To get from one room to another, what you do is you open the door and go through it. Likewise, the Egyptians believed that when the dead was buried in his tomb, the Ba would travel to the underworld through the false door. So. Once the dead enters the underworld, he has to then pass to, through the Amduat. And the Amduat is just the name for the underworld. The Amduat was divided into 12 zones or hours. Each zone represents one hour of night. So the Egyptians had a 24 hour day. 12 hours in the day. 12 hours in the night. So they thought the underworld was divided into 12 sections. Each section of the Amduat was filled with deadly challenges and demons that could fall upon the soul of the dead. Now, we have a pretty good description of their underworld in the Book of Gates, which has been preserved in several of the Tombs of the Kings. But the Book of the Gates is, is very interesting because it tracks the travel of the sun god Ray as he progresses through his night voyage in the underworld. Now, the Book of Gates is far more complex than what I'm going to present here. So understand that I'm only giving you a taste of what's happening in the night voyage of the dead. So there's a lot more to it, but we're just giving you a sort of a brief overview here of, of the Egyptian underworld, the, the life after death. Okay, so the deceased, his spirit, is Ba, you know, leaves its mummy, goes through that false door, and it enters the underworld as a mummy riding upon a hen henu, or what's called a night bark. So, the deceased soul is on a boat, and it's a boat that's following the bark of Ray as it passes through the underworld. Now, should the dead soul 
be unsuccessful in crossing any of the hours of the Amduat, he becomes lost and trapped by the dangers of that, that zone. So he has only 12 hours to make that crossing. In the first hour, so this is the first section of the Amduat, the gods of the West meet the dead and administer rewards and punishments upon those who dwelled there. Okay? Now these gods of the West, these are the first gods in the underworld that the deceased person encounters. The gods of the West, it's, it's very interesting because the way that Egyptian physical geography works in Egypt proper, in say the daytime, was typically Egyptians lived on the east bank of the Nile and buried their dead on the west. So the gods of the west are funerary gods. You know, Henti Amentu is a funerary god. He's the god of the west. So what we're seeing here is the beginning of the Amduat is that notion here that the soul has now gone to the west and has is passing from, say, this world to the next. Now, the second hour contained those who were blessed for living lives that were according to Ma'at. And Ma'at is the Egyptian concept of balance. Essentially, that you did led an orderly, well-mannered life. But it also contained those who were being punished by Atum, the creator god, who separated out the weary ones and the apostates and blasphemers of Re, who were doomed to destruction with their arms bound behind their back. In the third hour of the underworld, the dead person is greeted by twelve mummified gods who dwelled in a lake of fire which hurts the wicked but provided provision to the upright. So, even the Egyptian had a concept of a lake of fire, which is very, very interesting. Now, the gate for the third uh, section is guarded by a great serpent called Chetbi. And his role is essentially to open the gate, let Ra pass through that gate and the, the dead, and then close it right after. Some souls who enter the afterlife are crushed when the door closes upon them. Yes, the Egyptian underworld is full of hazards. It, it's not a safe place. In the fourth hour, there are an additional 12 anthropoid gods and 12 jackal gods and a lake guarded by 12 uraeuses. So here we see that the primacy of that number 12 showing the completeness of, of gods even here. So this, this symbolism for the number 12 is something we find across the ancient Near East. So very, very important even here in the fourth hour. Okay, now we get to the fifth hour. And this contains one of the most interesting scenes in the whole book gates. The fifth section contains the Hall of Justice, also called the Hall of Ma'at. This is where the, the god of the dead, Osiris, sits before a set of scales. And this is where the famous weighing of the heart scene was performed. And where the deceased had to recite the negative confession. Failure to recite the negative confession and to have a soul that was too heavy resulted in the soul being eaten by the crocodile, lion, and hippodemon Amit. Now, you would think that this would be the end of it. Okay? It, it, I mean, let's face it. At this point, this soul is probably going through PTSD. I mean, he's just seen some terrifying things going through the entire underworld so far. And he's just in section five. Okay? Um, and if, if, if the heart somehow passes this judgment, this is not the end of his perils. It's only the midway point. You know, there's still a lot of nastiness to come. 
Okay, so let's say Sol passes the, the weighing of the heart, and he gets to move on to the sixth section. This is the deepest area of the underworld. And it contains souls who are waiting to be revivified when the sun god Ray is united with his Ba. So these are people who are in hopeful anticipation that they might be revived. But no guarantee. So the sixth and seventh sections basically contain many sets of demons who punish the souls of the dead so as to expel negative elements. This is the Egyptian version of purgatory. So essentially, the souls of the dead are having their, their negative uh, elements sort of beaten, burned, boiled out of them. So what we see here is essentially, um, these are souls that are just waiting until they ask the question too, you know, what do we do? What happened to to the souls of the dead that didn't completely weren't so heavy that their boss were being fed to Amit, but not all that good either. There was more balance there than there was, say, goodness or Maat. So these are the souls that are, you know waiting for their moment of apotheosis. And that happens in the 12th section. So we'll get to that in a moment. So now we then get to the 8th hour of the Amduat. Like other sections of the Amduat, it also has a gate. And this particular gate is guarded by Abta, which is another monster serpent. They love monster serpents in the, in the underworld. And tier two, we also have danger. The souls who fail to cross the gate in the eighth hour wail, are said to wail in mourning. And the reason they're wailing in mourning is because their opportunity to pass is permanently lost. Souls stuck in sixth and seventh still have some hope of getting out. The ones in the 8th section have no hope. It's kind of like infamous saying, failure when your best is just not good enough. And this is what's happened here, is that in this particular case, the, the souls missed the boat. You know, they missed, the, they, they missed their flight and are now stuck in the 8th section forever. So that now we get to the ninth section of the underworld. And this is where they will see spirits of the divine chiefs floating on the primordial waters. Now, their purpose to, for floating here is to have their vitality restored. And we kind of see that the ninth hour is sort of a place of water. So we would here have basically water as a restorative principle for the dead, but also place where you could potentially drown as well. So this is this is sort of really, really typical of the Egyptian afterlife. You know, what can restore you can also kill you. So again, it's it's not a it's not an all benefits kind of deal here. Then we get to the tenth hour. And this is sort of the climax of the Book of Gates. This is where we see manifestations of the sun god Ray do battle with the serpent demon Apophis. Now, Apophis was the, the serpent who, was, who tried every night to eat the solar disk so that sun wouldn't rise in the morning. And every night he fails. But every night the sun god Ray does this battle, this, this perpetual battle with Apophis. And this is the big battle scene here in the, the 10th hour. In the 11th hour of the underworld, Apophis is defeated and dismembered, and Ra is victorious. Yay! Go Ra! Finally, the, the deceased 
soul makes it to the twelfth hour, which is the last hour of night. Ra has completed his nightly voyage, and after this, he then enters into the first hour of daylight, or dawn. Now, for the dead person, this is the end of his... This is the destination of his journey through the Amduat. The dead at this point shares in the immortality of Osiris and is restored to a state of incorruptible apotheosis. He takes on the attributes of godlikeness. And the benefit here for the deceased is supposed to be that when the dead enters this incorruptible state, he then is allowed to freely enter and exit the Amdua without passing through all 12 hours. So he sort of gets a teleportation pass. So, but his woes aren't quite over. In the 12th hour, the dead enters what's called the Fields of Osiris where he will work for the rest of eternity. Now, this is a very interesting aspect of the Egyptian afterlife. Should a person survive the voyage through the 12 hours of the Amduat, he will spend the rest of eternity working in the same job he held while he was alive. If the deceased made bricks in this life, they will make be a brickmaker in the fields of Osiris in the afterlife. If they were a farmer in this life, they'll be a farmer in the next life. If they were an IT worker in this life, they'll be an IT worker in the next life. If they were a vizier in this life, they will work the fields of Osiris as a vizier. The only exception to this is if you are a king, in which case they get to serve as a scribe on on Ray's solar bark. It is good to be king. So we have to kind of understand that the Egyptian notion of the afterlife is not very similar to, say, the Judeo-Christian version of the afterlife. Uh, there's no bliss. There's no rest from work. There's no feasting. It's more akin to the modern corporate world, where the reward for good work is more work and exactly the same work. You know, there's, there's just no... You don't go up or down in your station in life. So, during the night, the soul works the fields of Osiris. In the day, the incorruptible soul is able to return from the 12th, sec uh, 12th section of the Amduat to his tomb. While in his tomb, there he will reunite with his proxy bodies, where he can accept food and drink offerings and interact with the land of the living. Now, you might, wanna add, you might ask the question, well, you know, if the deceased in the Egyptian afterlife are working the fields of Osiris, you know, which which is, you know, they're they're, you know, cutting grain, plowing fields, watering, you know, they're doing agricultural work. Why do they need to come back to the tomb to be fed? Apparently, Osiris is a little stingy with the products of his fields. You get the pleasure of working for for Osiris. Just like you would work for a king, which means you don't get much in return. Osiris does not share his grain with you. So, it's necessary for the dead to keep returning to his tomb to be fed his offerings. So, then, once night falls again, the soul returns to the underworld. Where it, once again, in the twelfth section labors in the fields of Osiris. So anyway, that is a brief overview of the Egyptian afterlife. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you learned something. 
Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Thank you.